Hey everyone, welcome to Inverse Happy Hour. My name is Jake and I'm joined by a very special guest, Jeff Vandermeer, author of the of Annihilation and uh, the Born Universe books, a ton of great books. His most recent Dead Astronauts is out now. We're gonna listen to him read from that a little later, but right now we just wanna talk with Jeff about whatever's going on in his life. Jeff, welcome to the show, how's it going? Great, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, where, are you, where are you calling in from? Uh, Tallahassee, Florida, North Florida, so right. Panhandle. So I heard from a friend that you have some uh, nocturnal creature cameras set up around your home. Can you tell me a bit about uh, what, what you use those for? It sounds really interesting. Well, I have one, uh, one uh, uh, camera that I, I just basically move around the property. We're, we're um, off of this wooded ravine, uh, so even though we only have a half acre here, uh, it feels like more because the whole bottom of the ravine is covered in trees because it's really hard to develop because of erosion. So I started putting uh, the camera out at night uh, just to get a sense of what kind of wildlife we have. Given that we're only a 10 minute drive from the capital, you know, I wasn't sure what we'd find, but I've seen everything from deer and gray foxes uh, on the camera to our regular uh, residents, uh, three opossums, about four raccoons. <laughs> Uh, we have a couple of armadillos on the property, which is kind of cool. And uh, the most fascinating thing is, uh, they, they're not really on the trail cam, but I do come across them from time to time, is we have four or five box turtles, which is amazing because wow. some of them are 30 or 40 years old, and they only really live that long in urban areas that they don't have to cross a road. So they clearly, their territory is just in the ravine. And uh, so that, that's pretty amazing. But, uh, but yeah, so we, I have uh, trail cam footage of like a raccoon just like chilling out, and grooming itself and taking a drink, you know, right. and, and stuff that's more uh, dynamic. But it's kind of funny to just see animals that are just contented at night just wandering around the ravine. So. How big do those box turtles Turtles get, they must be pretty big at 34. Uh, like maybe the size of your face <laughs> or my face. That's not bad. <laughs> Tops, <laughs> they're not that big. Okay, they're not huge, but they're, that's they're still pretty huge. impressive. Uh, but they're really quite fascinating and they're much more uh, elusive than you might think. Like mm. if, you, if I bump into one basically and I look away for like two seconds, then it's gone. Like somehow it, it magically went through a portal in time or space <laughs> and disappeared, so. Interesting, interesting. Maybe that's a topic for another book. Um, I wanted to ask, so I know that you just came out with Dead Astronauts, and which is part of a series of books that are becoming a show on AMC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us anything about the process of turning your, these stories into a TV show? Well, first of all, I, I just, I had an early meeting with AMC before they bought anything. Mm. Um, uh, when I was in LA, LA once and I just got such a great vibe from everyone I met, like people who were just like really dedicated and passionate about what they were doing and respectful of source material and stuff. And so I was thrilled when they optioned The Born Universe, which is the th three books that are kind of related, but not really a trilogy, uh, yeah. Born Dead Astronauts and Strange Bird. And uh, it's been great so far. I mean, they keep me in the loop all, every step of the way. They you know, gave me a, a list, a rundown of who they wanted to go out uh, to, to possibly get a showrunner uh, mm -hmm. for. And, and uh, they were totally cool with the parameters I set up for what I was looking for in a showrunner. And uh, at this point, we've narrowed it down to a couple people. I can't really talk about it. Sure. All I can say is that um, something is being developed and I'm really looking forward to seeing it. And, uh, and they're really uh, just amazing to work with, laid back, but also really professional. and. Um, I'm really enjoying the process and I'm looking forward to being a creative consultant on however that, that project shapes up. So. That, sounds, that sounds great. Let me ask you one more question about that and answer it however you like. Uh, I know that these three books aren't exactly a narrative. So I'm curious, uh, what's the approach to turning them into a show? Is it, is it more narrative or is it more of an anthology? I think that the question really is um, one of scope because Dead Astronauts provides the widest scope. It basically gives mm -hmm. you over a century of time if you really think about it, um, yeah. which is kind of comparable in a way to um, the Southern Reach books. If someone had wanted to do like a 30 year TV show, kind of an overview of the Southern Reach and it's 30 years of grappling with, with Area X, uh, in this case, so so one possible approach is to do that wider scope thing about 
these rebels fighting this company across alternate Earths. And then a more intimate one, which is also very much possible because Bourne is the, the first thing that they, they optioned before they even knew that I was going to write more, um, uh, is that, that uh, relationship between Rachel and this creature she finds that's a bit yeah. of biotech in this ruined city. So, so really, I think it just depends on, on, um, on what the showrunner's vision is. I think either one could make a really good show. Cool. Yeah, sounds really interesting. Story of a girl in her blob, right? Right. <laughs> uh, and of course, they can't call it born because, like, even people who read the book, oh, yeah. they, they they type on uh, they type the wrong spelling on right. it because, of course, the thing of the born legacy and stuff. Yeah, yeah unless you get it, will be called them. blob. <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, you broke through with Southern Reach trilogy and Annihilation, which is a huge, awesome movie. Uh, and I know that the movie changes the ending quite a bit. Mm. Uh, you've said in the past that you think the ending to Alex Garland's movie is mind-blowing and different from the book mm -hmm. and compared it to 2001 A Space Odyssey. I'm curious, uh, what do you, what, how has your thinking on the ending evolved? What do you think it means? Um, well, I haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about that, to be honest. I think <laughs> um, the main thing for me is that I'm just an imperfect witness to the movie because... Mm -hmm. You know, I, we, we visited the set, uh, you know, the book is very different from the script. Uh, and then we saw a rough cut uh, where I believe, for example, the bear scene wasn't actually voiced by the actress. So oh. it was just some dude going, help me. Um, and then <laughs> the music scary. wasn't fully in place for the last scene. And let me tell you, the music really makes oh, a yeah. huge difference in how you can pace that thing. Because you couldn't go on that long mm -hmm. with the whole mimic thing. Um, if you didn't have the music, I really don't think you could get away with it. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, the thing, if I have any, you know, regrets, is just going through the process and realizing that a lot of the environmental stuff had been stripped down. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, it's because of the Annihilation movie that, that uh, tons more copies sold, which got yeah. the environmental uh, message across and gave me a lot more opportunities uh, to do other shows and, and movies. So, Makes sense. Yeah, that last scene, it's like, almost um, like an interpretive dance. I really, I really Yeah, like it. it's very daring. It's definitely very daring. And I just saw Devs and I really like Devs, the series he has on. Um, I was gonna ask about Devs, yeah. FX for Hulu. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, Devs and, is. Uh, uh, I thought that was really right. trippy and uh, took a lot of chances with pacing and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I specifically liked the way a lot of the violence was filmed in kind of a matter of fact way, not a horror movie way. Yeah. Um, and I think that that makes it even more kind of like uh, startling when it happens. And um, yeah, I thought that was really kind of, it was kind of fascinating too to see some of the the visual motifs from Annihilation in the movie reappear in Devs, especially the first episode. There's a lot of stuff that was giving me flashbacks to the Annihilation movie and <laughs> the way that he was shooting things and stuff. So that was, that was quite fascinating. Yeah, I do love this. You know, that really helps me think about it. I felt like in Devs, the world of San Francisco felt a little un unearthly, you know, almost like, almost like it, it shimmered, which now that I think about it, maybe makes sense. There's almost a sense of like, you're in the real world, but there's something qu not quite right. Right, well, actually, when you think about the whole series, <laughs> then who knows where you yeah. are. But, uh, but no, I, I, uh, I agree with that. I, 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 um, I just, I see it as like a, a weird slacker physics show or shoegazer physics TV series or yeah. something in a good way. But, um, but yeah, so, so I thought that was kind of cool too. It was, it was nice to be able to watch something of his mm -hmm. new that, that had nothing to do with my books and just appreciate it, you know, without any kind of filters. Uh, is there anything else that you've been watching or reading that you really enjoy that you could recommend to people as they look for things to keep themselves busy? Um, uh, well, we just, gosh, we just finished watching, uh, season two of Westworld, which I had initially bounced off really hard and yeah. then really liked the second time around, even though I feel like the Shogun subplot's a little, little, uh, small beer compared to the rest of it, but, um, but still it was fairly gripping. Um, we binge a lot of TV, so I'm trying to think. We're watching Baptiste, which... Uh, Babylon Berlin, the, the, oh, heard the Babylon Berlin. That whole series is absolutely amazing, hmm. and uh, Better Things is is pretty amazing as well. Uh, in terms of reading, I haven't had to chance to do a lot of reading to be honest. I don't know why it's hard to concentrate, but um, if you do want uh, a, a recommendation, I don't know if you want me to hold the book up or not, but sure. 
this Des Puentes by Vernon Subutext uh, is pretty amazing dissection of like French society, uh, both lower class and upper class and highly entertaining and literary and also kind of offbeat and strange and counterculture. Uh, and it's also been made into a series. So after you uh, read it, you can also go see the series, which I understand diverges somewhat from the book. And there's such interiority of character in the book, I can't see them uh, being the same. So, so if you want something realistic, I would go with that. The other one I highly recommend to people uh, is Audrey Shulman's Theory of Bastards, but then also this book uh, by Philippe Claudel, Broderick's Report, if you're looking for something strange and surreal. Of course. Um, any of those three, uh, I think, would definitely uh, reward uh, readers. And most of the time when I recommend this stuff, uh, these are the books that, that pretty much no one bounces off of. So. Nice. Uh, can, can, can you tell us a bit about your next book? Which, mm -hmm. uh, let me get the I have the title, I'm sorry. What's it? It's called A Peculiar, pa a peculiar Peril. It's a bit yeah. of a mouthful. Yeah, a little bit of a, maybe just change that to just apparel. <laughs> no, I like um, it. But, but, yeah, uh, what's it about? It's the uh, the misadventures of Jonathan Lamstead, and uh, there are a few different things going on. It's uh, it's kind of an epic fantasy, but also uh, set mostly on Aurora, this alternate Earth where magic's very wild, and uh, an alternate uh, Earth. Alistair Crowley is running a Franco-Germanic empire with the disembodied head of Napoleon as his military advisor, and Napoleon's still awesome. having to think about his height. He's uh, he insists on being at the top of this pneumatic column <laughs> that towers over everyone. And Charlemagne's a character res resurrected as a giant moth. Um, and they're talking marmots. Uh, and it answers the question of, uh, in part, you know, why in Narnia did the talking animals overthrow a fascist white witch only to accept a constitutional monarchy? Hmm. I never really understood why they did that, why they didn't just kick all the bastards out. So, um, so in, in part, this, this series, <laughs> which has a lot of intrigue and a lot of um, armies aligning, but also some very personal stuff as Jonathan, hmm. this 15-year-old, uh, tries to navigate uh, this world, which he discovers through a, a door in his grandfather's mansion. Wow. So it has like that kind of traditional setup, and then it gets kind of, like there's a lot of humor, even a lot of slapstick humor in it. Nice. And a lot of the villains turn out to have hidden depths and turn out to not be exactly as, as you might expect. And I just wanted a rollicking kind of adventure that was fun, uh, but also uh, plot wise was probably a little more traditional or intricately plotted mm -hmm. um, in terms of there's so many different characters uh, and pieces coming together. So. Well, it sounds awesome. I have heard it described as a, a YA book, and you said the main character is a teenager. Yeah. Is that, that feels like a departure for you. What was it like writing from that perspective? Well, I mean, I've already always written fantasy fiction, and that's really what it is. And um, I think as, as, as always, you just basically take your own experience, think about, you know, who you were growing up. And, and you know, I was a kid who grew up in Fiji, a British Commonwealth co country, and had a British accent when I came back to the US. So Jonathan is somebody who has lived both in the US and in the UK and is kind of like between both worlds. Um, and uh, so I just kind of channeled that and channeled the fact that I was a, a big nature lover and a little shy when I was younger. And uh, then also uh, I help, uh, or I'm, I, I co-run uh, Shared Worlds, a teen writing camp every summer and have for the last, uh, 11 years so that gives you a lot of insight uh and then you know a lot of what i read is is um, across a, a lot of different genres and, and things and uh so you know it's not it, it 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 it's maybe somewhat of a departure but maybe not as much as people might think interesting good to know for anyone for anyone a little worried it's it's still classic vander <laughs> anyone worried <laughs> i don't know maybe, I, i'm sure no one's worried um Worried about what? What? That it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's different. <laughs> you know, people hate, no one likes change. <laughs> well, then they clearly haven't been following my career. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. I'm sure your readers are uh, up for it. <laughs> um, I was looking at your Twitter recently and I noticed uh, you mentioned the a caterpillar costume. Yes. Uh, can you tell me the story behind that? Yeah, so I I I, uh, I set readers uh, twi my my Twitter feed up by uh, setting the trail cam uh, for mm -hmm. like three consecutive nights on this little bridge that goes over the dry creek bed uh, behind our house, 
and it would and just then you know post videos of animals that cross the bridge um, the raccoon and the opossum particularly like the bridge the, the the armadillo doesn't use it and then on halloween i had bought this caterpillar costume which is the caterpillar from alice in wonderland and I thought it'd be hilarious if I crept around the side of the bridge so the camera wouldn't get me right away. And then just on all fours, crawl across the bridge really fast. Um, and uh, the camera would pick that up. And I had to do it in one take because the camera resets and it won't take another video of motion, you know, for the motion detector mm. for like another 10 minutes. So, so I just barely missed not uh, uh, falling off the bridge. <laughs> and uh, it actually worked out really well. It was, it actually looked, uh, creepier than I thought because you couldn't tell what it was because the head of the caterpillar is 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 obscured and you just see like the the top of the head <laughs> and these weird legs <laughs> and um in fact when I posted it <laughs> the two things happened that were hilarious one of our neighbors immediately emailed me to say what the hell is going on down in the ravine <laughs> because <laughs> it wasn't clear and it wasn't clear to a lot of people <laughs> and then and then there was immediate fan art, which I found hilarious. Like within 20 nice. minutes, there was fan art of Jeff as Caterpillar Crossing Bridge. That's amazing. That's, that shows you really have great fans up there. <laughs> oh, man. But, uh, but yeah, eventually I had to let on it was a joke because some people were genuinely distressed. <laughs> there was something oh boy. going on. Like some, um, some like southern reach mutant as uh, in yeah and I, i've had to you know been re rewilding our yard with native plants and stuff and mm -hmm. uh i made a joke by posting a photo from brazil of a capybara standing next to a crocodile in <laughs> the lagoon and and said our rewilding was going really well and i had to retract that too because people really believed and i guess it's a testament to how much rewilding we've done yeah but suddenly we had capybaras and crocodiles in our backyard so well <laughs> anyway um, very cool. All right. Well, we're going to get to the reading in a minute, so stick around for that. But before we do that, I want to ask you a few lightning round questions if you're up for it. Sure. Uh, Post-apocalyptic questions. Just tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. We'll keep it quick and fun. Okay. All right. Question number one. If the singularity happened and you could upload your brain to a computer and live forever, would you do it? No. No. Why not? I have no interest in that kind of experience. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, if the zombie apocalypse happened, where would you go to survive? I would die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same here, I guess. <laughs> uh, would you help colonize Mars if it meant you could never come back to Earth? Um, the premise of the question is flawed because we're never going to colonize Mars. <laughs> I'm sorry to be the current downer here, but <laughs> Elon Musk, but you know. Sorry, Elon. Uh, you know. <laughs> so the answer right. is, mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> why, don't we, why don't we try to terraform our own planet proper to, uh, in, in a way that's useful to sure. us? Sure. <laughs> yeah, maybe fix this one first. Yeah. Uh, one last question. Would you rather be a robot with a heart or a human without a heart? Well, if I was a human without a heart, I'd be dead. And yeah. I don't want to be a robot, so I guess I'll be dead. All right. Maybe, uh, I guess I'll be a dead astronaut. <laughs> dead astronaut. Dead in the, yeah, just dead all around. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and yet, you know, it's hilarious. <laughs> Great. I love it. All right. Um, thank you so much, Jeff, for joining us on Inverse Happy Hour. If you're watching this video, stick around because we're going to jump right into a reading from astronauts i'm sorry dead astronauts, dead astronauts. Yeah. Too, title. too much bourbon uh <laughs> we're gonna jump straight into a reading from dead astronauts which will soon be an amc show maybe not too soon but eventually it's it's coming so again this has been jeff vandermeer and i'm jake and this is inverse happy hour thanks so much and i'll see you in the next video hi i'm jeff vandermeer and uh my <coughs> last novel uh, dead astronauts uh, came out in December uh, and is about a group of uh, rebels, uh, Chen, Grayson, uh, and Moss, who take on a nameless company across different timelines and different alternate uh, realities and different Earths. Uh, and uh, only one of them is actually a, an astronaut, Grayson. And uh, the scene I'm going to read is uh, one where they're actually taking a little bit of R&R &R between their attempts to 
overthrow the company, which uh, to their minds has destroyed the future of Earth. And uh, one thing to know is that Moss uh, is kind of their, is, is not just a person, but bioengineered to be kind of a portal between the different realities. So she's actually how they travel uh, that way. And uh, one kind of interesting note, perhaps, I thought, um, just so you could see it, is uh, this is my, I'm reading from my tour copy, uh, which I had every reader who came up to um, have a book signed, sign my copy of, of Dead Astronauts, as well as the booksellers. There wasn't always mission for the three. You couldn't mission forever, Moss would say, or there would be no mission, building an image from before as prod and tease. When she had hopped between the tidal pools and had run onto the beach just to pretend she had legs, to pretend she was not a wall of onrushing, onrushing, wall, onrushing. Danced on the beach all alone, had made play into a game of tag that wanted to be caught, to be it. Nothing must be glum, nothing must be serious, even if it was serious, not all the time. People were serious, but the world wasn't serious, not the drunk, lurching beetle that had feasted on the remains of an alcohol minnow, not the seaweed that brilliant and wet slap displayed its color and its texture there against the silly sea anemones blazing forth their tentacles. And if there were fewer creatures on this earth man had made, then still they took time to be still, to be thoughtful, to frolic. The three played cards sometimes to take the edge off. They had an old battered deck or played catch with a worn tennis ball. Or as here, as now, standing outside the south entrance of the balcony cliffs, each aware of the slant of a ravine and half-dead trees through which they could still see the company for purest white did blaze. Grayson's eagle eye trained on the holding ponds that she might determine from some break in routine or intervention if the company had sussed Moss's secret meeting the night before. Moss never liked team sports, though. Grayson, affectionate, you are a team sport. Chen found this so funny he could not stop laughing. It cut through his disapproval of Moss sneaking off, which evaporated as he would too one day. They had been in this spot before. Sometimes this was where they found the dollhouse half crushed, the one they used to strategize and brought it back inside, repaired it best they could. This time they had found what Grayson called a frisbee. What's a frisbee? Moss asked. This, this plastic disc. And you throw it. Why? For fun. Team sport. Grayson zipped the frisbee to Moss, who threw it straight up in the air like it was made of heat. Yet somehow it came down and leveled out and sped right into Chen's hand. He liked the grooved feel of it, yet the smoothness. They backed up into a proper triangle. Chen threw the frisbee to Grayson, who caught it, held it a moment, and tried not to laugh at the quizzical, worried look on Moss's face. They really did have teams, Grayson said. When? Ages ago, long ago, I don't remember when. It was too painful to think of her childhood. Chen thought he could remember when, too, but how could he be sure? What else like this did they have? Moss asked. Grace had ignored her, ambushed her instead with, Why did you go off on your own? Why didn't you let us go with? Deft like that, wanting to come at Moss sideways, but Moss knew it was just a reminder not to do it again. Grayson sailed the frisbee Moss's way, but too high, but then Moss was too high, and smoldering green in a way that made Grayson lustful and in awe, and the frisbee was caught, but not in the normal way, as if bouncing off a wall that fell away in the next moment, and there was an explosion of mint scent, and the frisbee which had flickered out appeared in Chen's outstretched hand, so quick he dropped it, and cursing retrieved it from the ground. Then he froze. How do we know it's the same Frisbee? They couldn't, Grayson knew. Are we playing Frisbee in another place too? Grayson leapt as she caught the Frisbee from Chen. No, Moss said. Somewhere else we kick a ball with our feet. We already did that, Grayson said, passing the Frisbee back to Chen, Chen back to Grayson. Remember, many companies ago. They do that now in the city, this city, Moss said. Give me the Frisbee. Grayson and Chen both chuckled. No, they said, and moved so Moss was between them. But not in teams, kicking the ball, Chen said. 
the frisbee passing around Moss, tricking Moss, or she was letting herself be tricked as she leapt for it, but they were swift too, and Chen had his hand tricks and looked her off, made her grow tall in the wrong direction, then ducked under and around. Give me the frisbee, Moss shouted. You'll just do something weird with it, Grayson said. But you love that. It was true, Grayson did love that. But they had a sweat on, they were competitive. Grayson and Chen both, in a way Moss was not. She was competitive, but not in the singular. So they kept it away from Moss for a while, and then she tired of their trickery. Moss became a wall between them and intercepted the frisbee. It went from Chen through Moss and out the other side came thrown at Grayson, a ball the size of her head instead, and Grayson ducked and fell, and Moss again herself, whatever that meant, laughed in the liquid vegetal way she had. And Chen smiled and radiated his love to them both, while Grayson feigned outrage. You've changed the future, Chen said, to change the subject, just in case. I can feel it. We can go home now. Moss and Grayson just stared at Chen. Which home? And uh, like I said, that's just a short excerpt from uh, Dead Astronauts, uh, which uh, has many different point of view characters, including a messianic blue fox. So I hope you uh, get a chance to pick it up and read it. Thank you.